Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are uh, tuning in from. I want to welcome you all to the, this Meet the Author event. My name is Tina Cowan. I am the Educational and Cultural Programs Manager here at the National Nordic Museum in Seattle, and I am delighted to welcome you to yet another one of our Meet the Author events. Uh, this program started in October 2020, and it has been a fascinating journey through contemporary Nordic literature, moderated by Elizabeth Denoma. Uh, today, we will meet Finnish author Sophie Oxenen, and who is one of the most acclaimed and awarded authors from the Nordic countries. We are so happy to have you here, Sophie. We are also, also very pleased with how this uh, Meet the Author series has developed, and we hope you join us next month when we welcome Arthur Herman, who will talk about his book, The Viking Heart, and this will happen on October 2nd. At the end of today's talk, there is a chance to ask questions, and we ask that you post those questions in the Q&A function on the screen, and we'll get to as many of those as we have time for. And if you think of them during the talk, feel free to uh, write them as you um, as you think of them. As I mentioned, this series is moderated by Elizabeth Denoma, and we are very fortunate to get to work with her. In addition to moderating these events, her great expertise in international literature, especially Scandinavian literature, has allowed us to host the most current and contemporary and interesting authors and translators in this series. We're very grateful. Elizabeth is the founder and editorial director of Denoma Literary Services. And in addition to her work as a translator and editor, she regularly leads uh, book international book events such as the London Book Fair and the Frankfurt Book Fair. So I will now hand this over to Elizabeth's very capable hands. And I hope you all enjoyed this um, uh, hour with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Dina, and welcome everyone. Um, to our discussion today with Finnish Estonian writer Sophie Utsunen. Um, I have a couple of um, logistical things. First, I'll start on behalf of the National Nordic Museum uh, with this acknowledgement that we are on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. We honor with gratitude the land and the tribes. This acknowledgement is not a substitute for authentic relationships with the indigenous communities. It's simply a step toward honoring the occupied land on which we live and acknowledging the impact of colonialism on indigenous peoples. The Nordic Museum celebrates indigenous communities in the Nordic countries and in North America through exhibitions, programs, and collections, and we cultivate respectful relationships with each other through these partnerships. Thank you. Um, as Estina said, as we're discussing with Sophie today, if anyone has questions, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we'll save like the last 15-ish minutes for them. Um, if there's something you really wanted to ask, get your questions in early so I know how much time to allocate for that. Um, so without further ado, today we are so pleased to have Finnish Estonian author Sophie Oxenen here to talk with us about literature, her own authorship, and specifically her latest book, Dog Park, which is launching this coming Tuesday in the US. This is an outstanding work of fiction called one of the most breathtaking novels of the fall and a high quality novel that reads like a thriller. Um, Sophie Oxenen is an award-winning international author, translated, I think, into, is it 46 languages at, the, at this point? Um, and too many honors and awards to actually enumerate them and still have time to talk, but among them are the Finlandia Award, the European Book Prize, the Swedish Academy Nordic Prize, and the French Booksellers Prize. Well, welcome, Sophie Oxenen. Where do we find you today? Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm in Helsinki, Finland, and I'm in my writing den. So this is my uh, digital event spot as, as well. well. It's a beautiful place. I think place. that's in my writing chair, so. That's a lovely, it looks like a lovely chair to be writing in, in a lovely space, and yeah. very conducive. Um, so it looks like your book is coming out in North America on Tuesday. What will that mean practically for you? Do you have a publication day ritual at this point? Do you, when, you, when your books launch, whether in English or Finnish or any other language? I imagine it was different in the pre-pandemic time. Uh, yeah, I was, I was supposed to have uh, 100 travel days last year. Well, of course I didn't. Um, so usually the translations mean that I travel a lot for festivals, fairs, book launches, and so on. Uh, the only um, kind of 
Um, well, the original book launch, that is when the book comes out in Finland, is uh, probably the most exciting one uh, in that way, that that is the moment when the baby leaves home um, and I cannot do anything about it anymore. So after that, it's up to the readers and uh, and so on. So it's not exactly the same anymore. Um, on the other hand, it's um, with translations, the reception is so different in different countries. Every single reader is an individual. And that, of course, gives me a lot because I might meet totally new interpretations like every year. And that's definitely interesting for me. I can, I can imagine, and I think we'll touch upon that a little bit later in our conversation too. Um, but going back a little bit, this is far from your first book. Um, with the first book, I think, having come out in 2003, you're a very yeah. established writer. Um, what drew you to work writing as an author, or what, do, I guess I should say, what do you think the job of a writer is, or what is your job as a writer? <laughs> um, well, I've always wanted to become an author uh, ever since I was six years old. And that is when I learned to write and read. But uh, already before that, I was creating uh, stories. Uh, so in that way, I, I guess storytelling has been in me always. So I was born with it. Um, but I wasn't um, born to a family where uh, culture was appreciated, sure, but there were no artists around. So uh, I didn't have kind of that kind of example. So I have no idea where it actually came from. Um, but maybe I was born with it simply. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've been compared to everyone from Margaret Atwood to John Le Carre to even Stig Larsson. Do you um, find that these comparisons are apt or do you think your literary project is similar to these other international authors in any way? Uh, well, of course, I love Margaret Atwood, uh, of course, uh, and um, and also Jean Le Carre, definitely. Uh, uh, Stieg Larsson, I like his book, but maybe I, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think we belong to the same literary field in that sense that he writes crime fiction and he's a genre author and I'm, I'm not, I'm a literary author, so that makes the difference. Uh, I, I think of the latest comparison for the, Dog Park well, actually came from uh, Denmark when they said that I'm the Nordic Charles Dickens, and I love that one. <laughs> so, uh, so usually I'm 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 compared to authors I like. So of course I have, have nothing against it. Um, but I well I've always loved historical fiction, so history is close to my heart. I've always had like a soft spot for it. Uh, and uh, definitely, I think that you can change the world with books and art. So in that way, I guess I'm a committed author. How do you think the literary landscape has changed in the time that you've been writing? Ah, well, a lot, a lot. Of course, the book industry itself has changed a lot. Uh, it's more focused on events. Um, I, I, well, now, of course, I'm talking from European point of view and from Nordic and Finnish point of view. Um, of course, the audio books, digital uh, books uh, have, have changed the industry. Um, and then, well, when I started my publishing career in 2003 in Finland, um, I, when I was asked what kind of books do I like and what are the authors that have influenced me, then I always mentioned, for example, Marc Duras and a couple of other French authors who write auto fiction. And at the time, uh, not a single Finnish journalist actually could recognize the word auto fiction, which, yes, I, I found it very weird because there are plenty of Finnish authors who have written auto fiction, so it's not nothing that doesn't exist here, but they just didn't understood what it actually meant, which I found very weird. Um, but now uh, it seems like all the fiction uh, is all around the world. Uh, uh, and I think there's a connection to um, true crime industry as well. Um, um, I know that in American movies, it's not a news to have, you know, based on a true story, but I, I think that's, uh, that has highlighted and become more and more uh, global in a way that 
uh, the audience is expecting fiction somehow to be true. And um, I, this conversation I find very weird because it's like, you know, we have been having this conversation for like over 500 years, you know, uh, the fiction is uh, depicting, it has a connection to reality, of course, but in a way that I find it weird that in 2021, we authors still have to explain the definition of fiction. Um, and of course, the uh, crime crime wave uh, is on a totally another level than when I started. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Um, I'm so looking forward to your book coming out in English. So obviously, I read it, and we're going to share a passage with it with um, the the people who are gathered here today too. I wonder if you um, would like to just set up the premise of the book for us, really basically. Uh, well, uh, Doe Park uh, is a story about two women um, who used to be friends, but friends, they are no more. Uh, it's uh, located in Finland and in, especially in Ukraine. Uh, the main character, Olenka, is, uh, uh, was born in a Ukrainian-Russian family in Tallinn, Estonia, at the time when Estonia was occupied by Soviet Union. Uh, so we are, we are moving back and forth between these uh, countries uh, and she had to escape her past. So these are the, this is where the story starts. Yes. And in the section you're going to read for us, Olenka is going through uh, an interview with, um, with a potential employer and they're sort of discussing her suitability, the positive and negative aspects of, of her, um, her attractiveness as a candidate as either an egg donor or a surrogate. Yes, and I'm, I'm going to read about that. And, and that's uh, the egg donation or donor industry, a fertility industry is one of the uh, main subject uh, in, in the story. And I wanted to write about it for multiple different reasons, but one is definitely that I, I understood that it offers a platform to discuss about, well, women's rights, children's rights, about the future in general, but I'll go to the passage. We went through everything that was good to share. If clients ask about Chernobyl, I should mention that I lived with my family in Tallinn at the time of the accident. From there, my parents had later moved to Mikolaev, nearer to my father's sisters, since she wasn't up to caring for their elderly parents alone because I couldn't show the more recent pictures of my father, we moved his death to a year when he still looked presentable. My cousin who died in the Afghan war was left in the family tree, but not the fact that my aunt had gone crazy after receiving her son in a tin coffin with worms slithering out of the gaps in the seal. Clients were interested in three successive generations, and so it was best if there were no unnatural deaths or any diseases that could be seen as genetic, either physical or mental. If any of your relatives are in prison, you should tell me now. But imprisonment isn't hereditary. Aggressiveness is, and you shouldn't tell that joke to any clients. I knew what she meant. Around here, the honest people are in prison and the liars are in parliament. When I asked if this meant a new family tree had to be pulled out of a hat for every Ukrainian, I received a bright shower of laughter in return, accompanied by a clicking of fingernails on the tabletop that sounded like summer rain. Westerners don't know how to think that, that way. A donor's father has to have a legal job. I won't even ask what your father's accident was or where it happened. Our Kopangas don't fit into their worldview. That was where your father worked, right? At an illegal mine. I didn't say that. And prison, what about that? My dad managed to die before he ended up behind bars. You aren't the first minus daughter to come to talk to me, nor the first whose family's livelihood comes from Kabongas. 
I understood very well that my father's story was ill-suited for my portfolio if I wanted well-paying clients. There was no room here for drunkenness, for suicides, assisted or genuine, let alone for illegal coal mining or poppy plantations. Let's forget all that and concentrate on finding the right education for you. A couple of years of comprehensive school isn't enough. So what if you left modeling to study and graduated from the Kiev National Linguistic University? I had passed the test. I was approved. My new boss called me a window dressing girl and wanted me to move to Kiev where he, we would serve Western clients better. And she even promised me in advance I could give my mother money and I would get my own apartment, my own bathroom, running water again and a new phone to replace the one I had, which was on its last legs. I could look forward to restaurant food, espresso, the life of an adult instead of a failure to launch. The boss arranged papers that said I taught English and French, which was completely believable given the language skills I picked up out in the world. And according to my payroll statements, I taught private evening le language lessons. An account statement purchased from a bank was necessary for the visas. The balance shown on it made me laugh in disbelief. I was beginning to look perfect, and so was my father. His records were changed to depict a construction worker who had died in an accident on a job site, and his final employee became a contracting company in Mykolaiv. According to my boss, the company was a reliable partner in a situation where girls' personal information needed a little aesthetic enhancement. So Snitsner was erased from my family history as if none of us had ever even visited. I've been ready for everything, anything, but now I rejoiced. I was able to keep my liver and kidneys and didn't have to knock on the doors of any more bright agencies. Compared to that, donating a few eggs was ridiculously effortless. Thank you so much for that. I love the dark humor that shot through that entire passing. Um, and there's it's very dense. There's a lot to unpack in that package, but why don't we start with the role of women's bodies and the commodification of women's bodies? Uh, yeah. Um, I wanted to write about Ukraine for a very long time, but when I noticed that they have unusually liberal family code, um, which gives excellent opportunities for those uh, who work in the business uh, of fertility business. And it started really to bother me. The idea, uh, I mean, uh, compared to other European countries and, and, uh, and many other countries, uh, the family code is really unusual because for example, you can choose the gender of your child. It is definitely the cheapest place to get a white baby uh, with a little help. Um, the uh, average income is very low, so it's um, it's definitely a very uh, lucrative uh, business um, for many, and also it's very uh, affordable and accessible for clients. So it's it's a very uh, it's a, it's a big business in Ukraine. And when I thought about that, okay, you can choose the gender of your child, and there are no age limits, for example. So it doesn't matter how old you are, you can have the baby. Uh, um, and it really started to bother me because it sounded like dystopia, but it's not, it's happening. Like it has been happening for a long time. And, and I thought that this is actually definitely something I want to write about also because it seems like that we don't have like mutual um, understanding of what's okay and what's not. There's no international mutual kind of pack that that's okay and that's not. And nobody is actually making sure that the women working in the business are actually okay. So um, thinking of the future of the humankind, uh, I think we need to discuss more about these topics. 
Yeah, definitely. There's some serious ethical implications throughout that entire thing. Uh, so um, in terms of surrogacy and donation, both Daria and Olenka find themselves at these places in their lives where they have to make this kind of choice to, yeah. um, can you talk about where they find themselves, what their position is that leads them to having to make these choices? Um, both girls, um, well, um, to start with, uh, I, I've written about um, human trafficking before. Um, um, in in per Perch, for example, uh, and uh, at the time, I, um, I, it, I felt very, uh, I, I was uncomfortable with the idea that when Soviet Union collapsed, me and of course all uh, newly independent uh, states were so happy about the collapse, collapse of the colonial power. Um, but what we didn't see at the time when we were, you know, uh, singing happily for the uh, freer world, uh, but we didn't see that actually the crumble, crumbling of an empire meant also that uh, structures of social welfare collapse as well, which meant that it created a very good ground for all sorts of hazy business involving exploitation. So exploitation uh, created field for human trafficking, uh, sex trafficking, and also later on for egg trafficking and for the surrogacy business uh, and the fertility um, industry, because all this uh, chaos uh, also uh, meant a very good uh, crown for uh, corruption. Ukraine is less corrupted thanks to the uh, revolution of dignity that started in 2014. It's definitely going to a better, uh, better direction. Uh, but uh, still, the corruption is a very serious problem. And that means that you can buy laws. So things like, you know, um, very um, hazy um, business of fertility uh, uh, industry is totally illegal. And uh, I wanted to know, like, why they have, uh, because it, it's not like... Uh, there's a strong church, for example, and one could have imagined that if you have a strong church, then they would definitely have a word to say about what to do with the women's bodies. But uh, church didn't intervene with this law. And, um, and, and so corruption is definitely connected to this and corruption, uh, uh, Corruption uh, in uh, jurisdiction uh, is definitely helping the uh, helping the uh, industry as well. So this is the um, the background of the system uh, where all this is totally possible and totally legal as well. And these girls, um, both uh, Ukrainians, uh, their roots are in Eastern uh, Ukraine. Eastern Ukraine is where in Donetsk, uh, in Donbas, where they are waiting the war at the moment. And um, it was um, 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 during the Soviet Union, it was a celebrated area because of the coal. They have one of the largest coal basins in the world. So coal industry is like really strong. And in Soviet Union, they were like, you know, uh, heroes. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, that that identity collapsed as well. And those, there was nothing given you know, in return. Uh, so people were clinging to the old Soviet identity, uh, which became a fiction or a fantasy because there's no reality back to that. And there's a lot of you know, illegal minds, as I mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of corruption um, and it's dangerous. So there's a lot of um, children are working in illegal mines. It's, it's pretty normal. Uh, and in a country where, you know, the average income is like just a few hundred dollars, you really need to have another job. Uh, you need, simply need that. And there are limited uh, possibilities simply because, I mean, if you want to have an illegal job, you have to pay for it. So in a way that 
if if you uh, want a proper job, you have to bribe someone. So if you don't have money, you don't even get an illegal job. So uh, everything you need uh, money for everyday corruption. Simply, uh, if you even though the healthcare is officially free, in reality it's not. You have to bribe someone. You have to be you know pay under the counter. So in in that kind of world where there's no social security, you need to have the extra job. And usually for women, it's um, bride agencies or egg donation and surrogacy. Because the money, even though from Western perspective, the uh, eggs and surrogacy is, well, especially from Nordic point of view, it's very cheap in Ukraine. But from uh, a Ukrainian point of view, it's, uh, it's big money. Yeah, absolutely. It, you can you can tell throughout the book that there is no outs for these people. There is no outside the corruption. There's no yeah. way that they can make their their make their way or survive outside of that. No. Um, and the 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 director who Wilenka is talking to says, you know, Westerners don't understand this. They won't. We can't. We can't. We can't present this face to them because it's not. They, there's a deep under misunderstanding. And she also calls into question why on earth would your family have moved from from Tallinn to back to Ukraine in the 90s. Could you talk about that a little bit for us? Like, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, um, I wanted to write about those who left Estonia uh, when Estonia regained the independence in 1991. Um, that's a storyline that actually doesn't exist in Estonian literature. Um, but there were like you know hundreds of thousands of people who left who had uh, come to country because of the Soviet occupation uh, and uh, after regaining the independence, of course uh, many of them also stayed in the country um, many left for example military personnel and then there were plenty of Ukrainians actually Ukrainians are still the second largest minority in uh, ethnic mi minority in Estonia uh, but this, this particular family uh, or the parents, they start to think that maybe we should go back to Ukraine, which also regained its independence around the same time. Now for our main character, it's not the same thing. This is the typical migrant, you know, migrant tale in that way that children are born in another country and she hasn't ever even visited, you know, uh, uh, Eastern uh, Ukraine, where her father is from. So it's even though the father is going home, but it's not home for the children. Uh, so the idea of, of the, uh, what the Eastern Ukraine is like is, is not exactly what uh, Olenka is imagining for her future, but children have no choice. Then again, the father sees lots of opportunities opportunities because all the national, um, all the mines and enterprises that used to be, used to belong to Soviet Union, they are suddenly privatized. So he sees business opportunities and, and gets involved with that. He sees that opportunity to become rich. Yeah. And that's, but that's a shock uh, to, uh, Olenka when she goes to Eastern, Eastern Ukraine, because it's very different from compared to where she's been living. Right. And even for her father, the opportunities that he foresaw didn't exactly pan out the way no. that he expected. Yeah. Um, I'll just leave it there so that people won't have that spoiled when they read Not the book. Spoilers, yeah. It, it is such a delightful book. I'm just going to take this opportunity to say, to encourage everyone to pick it up on Tuesday when they can. As I was saying to Sophie earlier, I read this just you know, like in one sitting from beginning to end with like a feeling of low grade tension throughout the entire panic, really throughout the entire thing, just wondering what was going to befall each of these people and then being um, delighted at the end. So um, at all the surprises. Um, all the details in your book, there's so many, every single sentence that we saw that we heard you in when you read that passage earlier, we could spend an enormous amount of time talking about every single one of those, like all the detail that's packed into that. Um, it makes the backstories and the characters so resonant. It must require a ton of research on your part. How do you go about that? Well, uh, I think you have to do research for every single novel. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, well, of course, uh, Ukraine uh, and the um, is a country uh, I needed to explore. But that that's fun. I mean, exploring new things is always fun. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm quite often asked if if uh, it's uh, distressing for me to write about you know uh, distressing <laughs> uh, matters or exploitation. But it's not. I mean, writing is not. Uh, writing is always fun, no matter what what you write about. Um, uh, but actually, the most difficult thing uh, for me when I was writing the story was uh, to understand how people at each other because the people are Ukrainian and I write in Finnish but I had the same problem uh, with uh, with my previous novels where I write about Estonian recent past and Estonians address people differently than Finns and if I write in Finnish I have to make it sound like good Finnish language uh, and a natural conversation at the same time the because the Ukrainian language is more formal uh, when addressing, for example, when a younger person is addressing older person or there's a hierarchy between the those who are having a conversation. And in Finland, there's not really. So you can talk in the same way to a older person or, or almost in the same way to your boss, to an older person or to your friend. Uh, so in that way, Finnish language is um, very informal. And all my characters are from countries where these kind of dialects is more formal. So that was actually the thing that I was struggling with uh, more than, uh, as I said, writing is always fun, but usually when author is asked, so what, what is the most difficult thing in the writing? then actually it might be the most practical thing that bothers you most. Like for me, this question about how to address people. Thank you for that. Um... The next passage we're going to take up talks about or involves culpability, guilt, and the possibility of escape, and maybe even redemption. Um, it's much later in the narrative. Olenka has been on the run, has made a new life for herself to some degree in Finland, where she's been discovered by her former protege, Daria, um, who's a little bit unstable and uh, in some degree uh, threatening. In this passage, Olenka is making a surreptitious call to a friend back in Ukraine, trying to understand what her options are at the moment. Would, do you want to add anything to that? Yes. You? Well, yep. I, I'll, I'll start. That's a. That's a. That's a. It, it, it's a good passage. I asked Ivan to tell me everything, and he began by describing your your meeting after Victor's death. You had gone to Ivan in Nikolaev and asked who could have hidden me or helped me and whether I had any relatives in Donetsk or Tallinn. Ivan was surprised. The connection to Donetsk was news to him. He had only known about my uncle in Tallinn. Did he buy that? I asked dubiously. Did you ever talk to anyone about any relatives other than the ones in Tallinn? Why would I have heard anything else? It isn't the same thing. You are family. Things went badly for us in Donetsk and you knew it. So badly that none of you ever breathed a word about the place afterward. I thought that it was a strong enough hint. Oh, how stupid do you think I am? I said that Ivan must have given something up. It would be strange if a friend of mine pretended not to know anything about me. But Ivan claimed that he'd gotten off just that easily, which was a surprise to him as well. He didn't lose any fingers, not even a single mane. And according to him, your interrogation seemed more out of obligation than any real desire to dig up information. I realized I was sweating. Certainly the sunshine flooding in from outside felt scorching. Still, I remained on the windowsill, wondering whether you had really let everything go. I thought I understood what was going on. You could have prevented everything so easily if you had checked whether my father had really worked at a construction company in Mikolaev and whether I had gone to Paris directly from Tallinn. 
You could have dug up my old schoolmates who would have told you about our family's move to a backwater village in eastern Ukraine. If you had shone daylight on my first lie, my career as a coordinator would have been at an end. You hadn't gone to the trouble though, because you had already done too many background checks during Kravitz's obsessive child project and your carelessness meant you bore a share of, a, of the blame. You were my unwitting co-conspirator and no one who was guilty of something like that would be eager to rehash his mistakes. It was probably easier to claim I had been so clever, my murder plot so flawless that I had even managed to fool you. I swallowed. You would never want to let me tell any, anyone who, how helpful you had been, just as vulnerable to love as me, just as seducible. By the way, you've developed quite a reputation. Conning the Mongol isn't easy, Ivan said. Maybe he didn't bother pressing me harder because it would have been embarrassing. His indifference made it seem like you didn't really matter. Vanity, I hadn't known that you were so vain about your reputation. The others wondered why you didn't kill the whole lot of them while you were visiting their house like a proper daughter-in-law. No one would have been left to take revenge on you. When you met Ivan later at the presidential villa, you acted like you were new acquaintances. There was no reference to me. I assume you understand you can never come back here, Ivan said. There's no trade that could get you that, but I'll deliver your message. Thank you for that. Um, one theme from that pas passage that stood out for me is this idea of culpability or guilt, responsibility. And there's so much of that throughout the novel at the individual level, at the familial novel, at the national level, at the international level. Would you talk a little bit about that, about um, historical guilt or the guilt that permeates the novel? Oh uh, yeah, um, I, I don't wanna give uh, spoilers, but sure. uh, there's... Um... There's a tragedy uh, connected to uh, Oenga's father and, and, and the family and what happened, which uh, also affects uh, Olenka's uh, choices in life. Uh, and she's like trying to escape, uh, escape what had happened. And uh, what had happened uh, is kind of one of those key moments uh, or of, of her life or what defines her. I, I guess most people anyway have uh, like those key moments in their life. And well, uh, Choice Carol Oates is a very good at, at writing about those key moments uh, that define you. And um, I, I think I, I do have quite a lot of those moments in my work as well. Definitely these inflection points after which nothing is going to be the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, shifting gears a little bit, but referencing what you were talking about, about writing in, in an authentic voice for your characters, there's a, 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 an issue that's pretty rampant in publishing, at least on this side of the Atlantic, which is that of sort of cultural appropriation or voice appropriation. Um, that is to say, there's a lot of books have come into criticism now for representing characters that are that belong to groups they themselves don't belong to or being stereotypic in representation. And I just, I wonder what you thought about that. Well, cultural appropriation became like a, um, like a thing in a Finnish public discussion a few years back. Um, it seemed like uh, journalists had seen the light in a way that they, they obviously hadn't thought about it before. And um, it was kind of new thing uh, to them, which kind of surprised me. It surprised me because every time I write about Soviet Union, Soviet Union, I write about cultural appropriation. Soviet Union was a colonial power and colonial power is always uh, using the toolbox of cultural appropriation and um, all Baltic states have gone through that bath, definitely. Uh, and so 
did Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is still um, suffering from, or let's put it like that, that uh, people are still seeing Ukraine. Uh, not all, of course, but quite many people are seeing through the lens of Soviet slash Russian lens. And that's like, it's, it could be compared to, uh, you know, pick up any African country and try to uh, see them through the lens of the colonial power, whether it was uh, Brits or uh, Portuguese or, or French. It is exactly the same thing. And uh, all former uh, Soviet colonies have have to struggle with this colonial past. So um, in that way, I am taking part with my work to that decolonization project and therefore cultural appropriation is definitely what I'm actually writing about. Absolutely. And, and on a related note, you've mentioned, um, you've spoken about how the victors are the ones who have written the, the formal histories and um, you, your work, part of that project seems to be to be rewriting that. Ah, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and, uh, and well, of course, um, <laughs> I write in Finnish, which is uh, uh, compared to English as a small language. And, uh, and um, when you think about, you know, the First Nations of Russia, um, Finnish language, uh, just like Estonian language, they belong to the group of finno ukric languages. There are around 20 finno ukric languages and only three of them are thriving in their own national states, that is Finnish, Estonian and Hungary. And rest of those uh, uh, people representing uh, finno ukric languages are living in Russia. And their culture is, has been and is being destroyed. So um, in, in that way, um, I try also to, um, to, you know, to draw attention to the problems of indigenous people living in Russia. Um, unfortunately, they are sitting on oil. So you know what it means. Yes. <laughs> they yes. will never have the, they never have the opportunity to, uh, to uh, have an independent state, for example, and so on. And so, um, I worry for the liter literary culture. I understand that, yeah. And the yeah. language, is of yeah, course. Well. Absolutely. Part of what you've spoken about is, um, and it's related, is taking away monuments and renaming things. Like, re. Yeah. Uh, would you like to talk about that in a little bit of detail? Yes. Um, in in, the, in uh, Door Park, um, we are. Mm. Uh, Olenka is following, of course, the uh, revolution of dignity in Ukraine and also the how the war started. And she is uh, seeing also, uh, but but she is already, you know, she had to escape. So she is following the uh, what's happening in in Ukraine from the distance, and and also she is following the renaming of the streets and toppling the Lenin statues and so on, and. Um, and that is, um, I'm very happy about that um, the communi uh, communism project in, in Ukraine because um, that is what happened in Baltic states um, in the beginning of 90s. And uh, now the same is happening in Ukraine. It just took a while, but it is happening. Uh, I remember when I visited Ukraine, I don't know, was it 10 or 15 years ago? Uh, and uh, I was kind of uh, startled in a way that how it, it not everywhere, but there were like islets where Soviet Union was still very much alive. And I, I understood that it is not past for these people. It is present and that people are actually making new memories based on very living Soviet uh, legacy. Uh, and now those like places of worship, like, you know, statues of Soviet leaders uh, and uh, statues of people who are res responsible for famines and, and deportations, they have been toppled. And that definitely is very important. Even though you might think that, okay, statue is a statue, but you cannot worship, you cannot uh, honor 
um, uh, the symbols of totalitarian rule in the same space where you, where you try to build democracy. It just, they cannot breathe the same air. Right, right. And um, in this country, we were going through a, a similar exercise in removing um, um, uh, figure, ra historical racist figures, for, um, yep. from, for instance, the Civil War, things like that, um, several hundred years later. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, all of your books have been translated into you know, some collection of languages. Um, just given the logistics of that, it means that you've been more widely, widely read, and you, indicate, you hinted at this earlier, you more widely read in translation than in, than in Finnish. Um, how involved have you been with the translations of your books into the various languages? Well, I, I don't speak that many languages. <laughs> um, uh, but of course, I, I did read the English translation. Uh, Owen, uh, Owen Witzman is a, is a uh, absolutely wonderful, um, wonderful translator. So I'm very happy to have him, have him as a, as my translator. Um, and uh, well, I, of course, I do have conversations with my translators, um, but I've, I've been lucky in that way that uh, many of my translators are actually translators who know um, Eastern European matters very well. And even though you might think that, OK, a translator, to, you know, just translates the text, then it is actually very important that they know the context. Because, for example, I do remember one that was a long time ago. Um, uh, it was from when the doves disappeared, where a, a translator who knew nothing of Russia or Soviet Union translated um, a particular. Um, oh, it, it was a um, kind of cabbage soup type of soup, uh, very common in in Soviet Union and and. Uh, she has translated into um, mac and cheese, um, and 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 um, and that kind of didn't. And and she was also kind of you know adding um, like um, meatballs in a places where you couldn't have. I mean, uh, uh, mince uh, is is was uh, in Soviet Union a very particular food in that way that you really needed to know the person you, who is actually giving that meat to you because no one would ever buy it from the store ever. Um, probably it didn't exist, but if it, if it did, no one would ever buy that because of the quality. You don't want to eat rats anyway. So, um, so in a way that it was, and for example, I remember a sentence where a cabin was translated into a villa and, <laughs> and that's not like, you know, there were no villas in Estonian countryside. So that gives a totally different kind of um, uh, image of, of, of the context when I'm talking about like a very small cabin and then there's certainly villa and of course that. So you need to know the context and you have to be able to imagine that. So I'm very happy that uh, many of my translators actually actually do know, some of them know Russia or have been uh, studying uh, in, in Russian, for example, or in Estonia and so on. So. I've been lucky, all authors are not that lucky, so. I, yeah, it seems like that would be very important, especially for your work, where this, this level of historical knowledge isn't a backdrop, it's, it's, yeah. you know, it's woven throughout the very fabric of the story. Yeah, and, and of course, um, I have also ex excellent editors, so, uh, so it's a collaboration between the translator and the editor. Uh, and the editor is not the one who can read usually the original text. So if there are questions, of course, I'm happy to answer that. And one particular feature in Finnish language that also uh, sometimes uh, can be, can create a weird situation is that because uh, Finnish language is gender neutral. So, uh, <laughs> so if I'm writing about a doctor, I don't need to think about whether it's a she or he. It's just a doctor. 
Uh, but if there is no particular reference to the gender in the text, like, you know, saying that the doctor had a skirt, let's like that, then the translator is the one who is making uh, the decision about the gender. And so sometimes they are asking, should this be she or he? And, you know, it is very weird because when I write, I might not even think about whether it's a he or she. Right, they, they call that the, the art of translating 100 choices per yeah. page. So there's a lot of, a lot of people don't realize how, it, how much influence the translator has on the text. Yeah. But you've certainly been very lucky in this one, or, or, or I mean, you and Owen have worked together before. It's a beautiful translation, just absolutely fluid, complex. Lovely. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, we have a number of questions from people here today, and I want to get to all of them. So let's see here. Um, one person asks, how did you do the research for this book? Did you also spend time in the Ukraine? Which I think you've said, you've mentioned you have. Yeah. 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 And of course, um, there were a number of details uh, I, uh, I had to ask from Ukrainians uh, and so on. And I also... Uh, had a Ukrainian reader for the original text, uh, the Ukrainian who is one of those rare Ukrainians who is actually fluent in Finnish. So he could, yeah. Otherwise, I, if I hadn't had a Ukrainian reader, I probably wouldn't have dared, you know, to, uh, because there are so many number of small details where you can make a mistake, you don't even notice that. Uh, like, for example, it, most of the thing, uh, there are so many things that you can, you know, you can you can do the research just, you know, by reading or, you know, going to places. But for example, about behavior, uh, like chesters, for example, uh, like where, well, compared to Ukraine, Finland is, uh, well, uh, Finnish language is gender neutral, but also uh, it's not that important who is actually opening the door. In Ukraine, it's more important that it's the man who opens the door, you know, and they don't shake exactly. Nowadays, they do shake their hands, just like Finns do. But there are also, in a way, situations where it's not likely that they would shake their hands. Uh, and these are the things that, you know, it is, you really need to see them or you need to ask uh, ask local help. Right. Uh, the next question is, um, there's a little context here. I work in the field of medical bioethics. You touch on a very timely bioethical issue. To what extent do some women feel it's their right to, to um, do this, being surrogacy or egg donation with their bodies? Do some women celebrate this opportunity? I can see this blurring the lines between coercion and autonomy and then she, uh, she adds, I can't wait to read this book. Well, I'm, I'm happy to have, uh, have uh, the medical experts uh, in, in, the, in the audience, because I think this is a very um, important topic. And uh, when you there, I mean, there are so many uh, lobbyists and promoters who promote for the, uh, for the benefit of the clients. Um, uh, but actually, um, those who donate and who, those who, or, who work as uh, surrogate mothers, their situation is so much worse. And I, I wish to raise the awareness also simply because, uh, um, because uh, donation can, uh, th there's a risk of very long-term health problems. Uh, you might lose organs, you become, might become childless yourself. Uh, and um, usually those women are not the ones who are women of means. That means that they should definitely uh, have free legal consulting, for example. Uh, also, when it comes to the contracts they are actually signing, let alone that they should have assurance of, of the uh, to health uh, insurance to, to uh, make sure that they'll be okay later on. Because, you know, when they're out of the system, nobody's going to help them, help them. Right, and we see that in this, in the, it becomes a, a feature of the plot as yeah. the way it plays out in this book. So the, the person asking the question has that to look forward to in reading the book too. Um, there's an, uh, an, uh, some of these questions we've touched upon in our discussion already. Um, here's 
Purge was also adapted for the stage, at least in Finland. Are there any plans to adapt a dog park for the stage? And Kitten, you say anything about what's coming up next for you? And I'm going to append another question that I had to that, which yeah. is you've done so much work in the adaptation of your, um, your work to stage, to film, uh, to opera, even, I think, where you were yeah. libretto for a different opera. Can you talk about those, the questions this, this person asked? Uh, well, Perch was a play um, before it was a novel. So first I wrote the play and then after that I wrote the novel. Um, uh, Dog Park, um, I, I don't think I'm going to write a, a play. Or, but, I, you know, maybe someone else does because uh, my first novel, Starling's Cows, which is not available uh, in, in English, uh, it was a novel and then it just got the first uh, stage ad adaptation a few years ago. Uh, so if someone else wants to do it, then of course I'm, I'm happy about it, but I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, usually uh, novels, a novel, writing a novel takes so much time that after you've done the novel, you don't actually want to, uh, want to write another adaptation. So if I write, a play or, or something else about something that it's possible that it becomes a novel later on, but not the other way around. That makes sense. Um, another person asks, speaking of statues of tyrants being toppled, what, what do you think of the statue of Lenin in Seattle, which stands as a sort of a joke? I, you probably aren't familiar with it, but there's a neighborhood with a statue that had been Brought over after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, um, was, but I don't know what the debate around it. Uh, I mean, is it, um, why do you want to have it? Yeah, it's not, it's not really a debate. I think it just, it stands as sort of, you will definitely be familiar with the, the sort of um, kitsch, Soviet era kitsch um, value ah, that a lot okay. of the relics uh, have. Well, there are, um, for example, in Bolik states, there are, um, a sort of uh, statue parks where you know you need to know uh, the history, but there are, or you can have the uh, statue, but you need to have a proper information about the person. You know, Lenin is not a savior. He was actually, you know, a murderer uh, who actually, you know, uh, encouraged people to um, erase nations and liquidate. Uh, ethical uh, ethnical uh, and religious groups so he was not like he was not a nice person at, at, at all or responsible for genocides so uh, in that way you can have the, the statue but it's not kitsch you should have you know proper information about the soviet legacy and lenin's legacy as well so uh there's nothing i mean could you imagine that there's a statue of hitler and then it would be said that it's kitsch. Right. No, it wouldn't be possible. So um, in that way, I think you should, you can have the statue, but you have to have a proper, uh, proper, um, proper information about it. Thank you for that. Um, I know we're coming to the end of our time here and we've gotten all the questions. Um, I'd like to know, what are you working on now? Obviously you have a lot of work around the launch of the book yeah. and the English language rollout, but. What's next for you? Uh, I won't say a word about it, but it's uh, there's a new novel coming up, but I'm not going to tell you what, um, I'm not going to say anything about that. Well, we'll just have to look forward to reading it then when it comes out. All right, thank you so much for your time today, Sophie Oxen. Um, thank you. This is a delightful book and I'm going to just encourage everybody to read it. And then I have a couple, just a couple of logistical things here at the end. Um, you can pick up this book as when it comes out at the National Nordic Museum gift shop. In the next session of Meet the Author, we'll be talking with Arthur Herman off of the new book, The Viking Part, and that will be on October 2nd. In closing, please consider making a donation to the National Nordic Museum through their website if you're in a position to do so. Details available on the website, the nationalnordicmuseum.org. Thank you all once again for taking part in this session. Thank you so much, Sophie, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. And thanks for everybody over there. So thank you. Bye. -bye. bye.